uh, both new revenue and renewals in terms of what he brings, uh, not just in new revenue, but uh, continues in working with his customers. He works with both small and large customers and is truly a consultant. When you heard what Chris Schubert was talking about in the back of being a consultant and not just getting prices, uh, Tim is a consultant and has great things to say about retention, about customer service. Gayla Gorman, you may have heard about uh, recently. Gayla and Charlie have bought in some monster deals. Chris, of course, also referenced uh, Charlie multiple times. Uh, Gayla uh, has, has uh, been working with Charlie in closing, I believe it was both a $30,000 and a $60,000 deal uh, at the end of last year. Monster deals, uh, of course, they worked for a very long time. You may want to find out some things from her uh, about those deals, how they brought them in, how they worked them, uh, what it took. Um, also, Steve Roy, I think many of you know Steve Roy, um, tends to uh, float to the top of the scoreboard when he's on his game. Uh, Steve, <laughs> Steve is also a phenomenal consultant. Uh, he happens to uh, go to New York occasionally to consult uh, Goldman Sachs and some of the other investment banks on telecom. Uh, he's a great consultant uh, in, in terms of selling direct to customers, also understanding the technology and retention as well. He sells very sticky products. He also has extremely high retention. Uh, Jeff Ott, uh, who is also leading his group in uh, providing a solution that I believe that grocery store would have to float a, a bomb to uh, afford, uh, but was certainly a bulletproof uh, solution. Jeff Ott, you probably uh, have seen on the scoreboard as well. I believe uh, he just uh, brought over a rest board for $80,000, uh, sold a deal to Tyco International, uh, I, I believe was uh, close to 100000 is it? Um, uh, significant numbers of large deals coming through uh, that he's closed. Also, uh, uh, a text messaging service uh, that I believe is uh, uh, expected to build uh, 100,000 as well. Uh, some monster deals, and I, I want to start with that. There are a few things that I think you'll want to hear about. Uh, number one, uh, big deals. Everyone likes to hear about big deals. Where do you find them? How do you close them? Who do you work with? Who do you talk to? Uh, those are good questions to ask, and you may want to ask. Also, retention, uh, great questions, especially when your base uh, that you're working with has you know, uh, been around for three years, four years, five years. What do you do with these customers? Uh, how, how do you interact with them? How do you reach out to them? Great questions to ask. What I want to start off with, as you're thinking about your questions, I'm going to ask Jeff to talk a little bit about the RFP process, uh, which is something he uses to really lock in his customers. When he quotes a customer, they're not going anywhere. Uh, and Jeff will tell you a little why. Jeff, you can take a, a few minutes uh, just to explain to people uh, some of uh, your approach in terms of uh, uh, presenting to them, developing an RFP, and the arrangement you have with your customers. Would you mind doing that? Thank you, Adam, for the kind words. I remember when you and Patrick first approached me about this panel. It was really clever how you did it. They said, are you a proud American? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Do you believe in the Federalist Papers, founding documents, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights? Do you believe in free speech? I said, yes. They said, great, you're about to give one. <laughs> <laughs> so can everyone just stand up for me one minute, please? <laughs> I'm really tired. Uh, stretch a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Blood pumping. I have to have energy to give energy, so please take one step back, one step forward. I also wanted to demonstrate my ability to lead a large group. <laughs> so, RFPs, request for proposals. I think it started out in the federal government, state government, county government. They can't buy anything unless they get three bids. And the RFP started there, and then it was adopted by corporations. And there's a lot of agents and bars, if you will, that solely focus on writing RFPs for a business, and that's their only way of making money. I like the RFP model, which dovetails closely with auditing, bill audits, and telecom expense management because you need to differentiate yourself, figure out what everyone, other, other, every other salesperson is doing and do something different. Because there's a lot of uh, direct sales forces, channel sales forces, a lot of people 
doing very similar things. I can save you a lot of money, here's a great price. And I, I find that that's, while it can be effective if you do it enough times, it's not always that effective. So becoming that consultant and adding value, having more than one way to make money, uh, and RFPs are wonderful. I, I, as a general rule, I never respond to an RFP unless I write the RFP. Because you'll never win an RFP unless you write the RFP. So that's kind of rule number one. But basically, in simplest terms, it's your job to engage your client, write a scope of work, which details all the steps in doing a request for proposal, request for quote, managing the process, understanding their network, designing their network, and then basically um, having the carriers that best fit that design respond formally in writing in a precisely defined format. So I don't want to get in the weeds technically here, but uh, that's what the essence of an RFP is. And I don't know how many agents, show of hands, have done wonderful, great work, gotten a great pricing, and the deal just went south for some unknown reason. Has that ever happened to anybody? <laughs> nah. No? Okay. Well, typically what's happened is you were uh, affectionately known as spreadsheet fodder. <laughs> they, they used all your hard work to get them a price where they could go to AT&T, Verizon, whoever they were with, and say, look, if I just move, I can get this price. What are you going to do for me? Carrier says, I don't want to lose your business. They match it, and your deal just walked. So RFP kind of separates the wheat from the chat. <laughs> if you write the RFP and the customer agrees to pay you to do it, you know you have a serious client who's ready to leave. And I'm very competitive, so I, I write a lot of RFPs and then I noticed I was getting into this competition with RFP writers who had a lot more extensive history and references writing RFPs. So I basically did what Tolaris just did to uh, MasterString. I said, great. Since I make money brokering deals and writing RFPs, if you let me broker your deal, I'll waive my fee. So I uh, use that strategy quite a bit because I don't want to lose. If I'm going to invest a lot of my time and efforts into doing a deep dive, a consultative sales approach, I want to win the sale. Hey, Jeff. Uh, you keep saying writing an RFP. Could you just back up and explain to me, maybe others, what you mean what, when you say you're going there to write an RFP? Well, you're, you're, basically, you're basically selling your client to the vendors. You're writing about their history, how they came into being. You're writing about all their network services, all their buckets of business, how great they are. And then you're saying, this is the current client's network. This is what they like to migrate to, and basically, please price this exact, these PRIs, this MPLS data network, this data center, and you line item all the services your client wants, and then you go request the carriers to respond to your RFP. So it's the same thing you do every day, informally. You get pricing, you give your client options, and they pick the one they want to <coughs> make the sale. This is just a formalization of that process. And you charge for that? You do. 200 an hour is what I charge for. So, um, it, 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 so then I have a question which probably everybody else is, at, is wondering as well. Um, so you charge them an hourly rate, like a not to exceed kind of thing? Is that how you do it, or you just charge them an hourly rate? There's but then it's usually waived. It's waived if they select one of the people bidding that you actually can broker the deal through. Right. So if they kind of, because we've been in situations before where we've been forced to pull a carrier in that we couldn't broker the deal, so then they're going to pay you for your services if that were to happen and they end up with that carrier. Correct. Okay. And, and, that, and that's the, the thing that would almost make it impossible for them not to buy a carrier you broker. Because of your fee, if you divide that by the monthly contract value, it's going to cost them a lot more money 
to go with the carrier that it's not going to do the same thing to you. Verizon, I mean, they all do it. Their direct accounts, the global account teams think they're better than everybody else. So it's a whole different power relationship when you say Quest, AT&T, Verizon, I wrote this RFP. If you want a chance at this business, you need to respond to it. It's a lot more fun to come at the carriers from that power equation. And they will always say, I want that account. I will play by your rules. Are we able to ask questions at this point? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Um, $100 an hour. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> How many hours typically? Um, my question is uh, uh, if they I'll just drew a blank. <laughs> Go ask your question. I'll do these people come for you? Uh, come to you looking for an RFP? Oh, no, that's what I'm Or do you propose? If if I know they're big enough that I'm going to get hassled by AT and T and Quest and Verizon about paying my paying me for the, the sale, I always suggested by asking the right questions. So scared of that yeah. direction. Right. So you've already sold them at that point. When they, once they've agreed to do the RFP through you, they've already said, I'm going to do business with you. Correct. And one of the carriers that you represent. So you've already, already had to sell them at that point. Yeah. That's, that's, the, <laughs> that's yeah. the key point. Yeah. How big would you say a client needs to be before a RFP process makes sense for them? My rule of thumb is thirty thousand dollars a month before it makes sense to do an audit. And audits and RFPs and telecom expense management are all in the same family of consultative services. Audit is basically a free service to your client. I'm only going to charge you 50% of the savings I find you by telling you how much at and has been ripping you off for the last three years. Very effective strategy. But that audit gives you a lot of cash flow and it also gives you all the information you need to write the RFP. So it's, it's twofold. And then once you complete the RFP, you get it installed, you get it going, and you get paid. Then most clients don't want to get six months, a year, three years uh, behind and overpaying for unnecessary charges. So telecom expense management just audits the bill every month as a value-added service. And that's how they work together. Also, if, if an agent in this room comes across an opportunity where an RFP may be a possibility, can they contact you? Would you help them write something like that? Or like an SME like we have in our Tillerge back office for like help? Yeah, I, uh, I have a, a white label program, so it's pretty hard to say, I'm going to write RFPs, because clients can ask you, well, who else have you done it for? So in order to help people break into the business, you can use my references, RFPs I've written, scopes of work I've written, and I just simply wholesale it to you, and you can mark it up and make whatever you want to make. So it's a very simple process. You know, I, you brought up a good point about the fact that the RFP management and the, the audit is another revenue stream, which uh, I think we're all looking for diversifying our revenue stream across carriers and markets and industry segments. And we've done the same thing with uh, professional services, um, where we'll pull, we've done, but even for smaller customers, it doesn't have to necessarily be a full on RFP. It can be something as simple as a customer had an existing AT&T contract. I knew I wasn't going to get paid to renew it but we uh, charge them professional services fees simply to renegotiate and re return the contract for them. Uh, done the same thing where we've done PBX selection for customers and uh, coordinated moves. And, as long, and, and even some situations in the RFP process where um, the customer know, knows that they want to now select multiple carriers and equipment suppliers and they want somebody to coordinate it for them. And we've done that with a full upfront disclosure that we are also getting paid by the carrier. And customers generally, you know, when you're upfront about it, said, look, I don't care if you get paid on the backside, just as long as I get value out of the services that you're giving to us. So you, know, we've, uh, you could say, call it double dipping, but the customers are very understanding. And, uh, it's, a, it's a nice way to, again, to diversify your revenue streams. Steve, well, what, do you, uh, what do you normally charge per hour? Is it by job or is it Histor uh, historically, we've done it by, by job because uh, they're small enough that we can get our, our scope around. It's something that, uh, as Jeff has described, 
uh, an hourly rate, maybe a safer way to approach it. Um, all depends on how much experience you have doing that type of job. And you and uh, sometimes what we'll do is we'll say, look, this is our expectation going into it that it will be a five thousand dollar job, a three thousand dollar job. Um, if I get halfway into it and it looks like it's blowing out of scope, you know, we have a handshake agreement with some of our customers, and they said, look, how much more do you need? So we're uh, we're very I'm very upfront communicating with my clients uh, if I'm getting uh, if the if the if the job is well scope from the original definition. Do you have a percentage threshold that you use? Like let's say if I don't say you get twenty percent in the uh, audit, uh, you know, it's free to you or anything like that, because usually if it's ten percent or less, the customer's not gonna do anything. For for bill audit, I'm sorry. For bill audit purposes, yeah. in your case, it's you know, the the opportunity is still large enough. You know, thirty thousand or more it doesn't make. You know, but in the smaller in the smaller accounts. Yeah, I started off doing audits uh, eight years ago, and uh, but it, but I was I was not working accounts that were sufficient size to make the audits worthwhile, and so I I very seldom will do it. I, uh, Back in the last several years, I can't remember one instance where I've done a contingency-based audit. In the last several years, I've not done a contingency-based audit in a couple of years, okay. and it's just something I'm not more. I'm, I'm less interested in doing it now because uh, uh, again, we uh, well, what we with the relationships that we have going in with the audit, we know we're going to get the business to begin with. So I'm not. I, I, I haven't had the same situations that Jeff has had arise. Jeff, have a question? We here. I'll talk to you with the mics, everybody can hear. Yes. Okay, question. Overcoming objections with what you do, it's a fantastic idea. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about it, but you control the cards here. So how do you overcome uh, conflict of interest? <coughs> well, the main thing is you disclose. And that's what I always do. I get paid many different ways. I can be an outsourced CIO for clients. We can bill 150 to $400 an hour, do security, computer forensic audits, and uh, I'm background is IT consulting. So it's just very normal for me to write scopes of work and <laughs> this project's this many hours, or this is the hourly rate. So you always want to disclose to your clients, even informally. I mean, even with what we do every day, Mr. Client, you know, I'm agnostic in who you do business with. Every carrier pays me a commission and upfront money. It's usually about the same. I don't really care who you do business with. I just want you to do business through me because that's how I make a living. And I'm going to invest a lot of time doing quotes and pricing and designing your network. Um, and so a lot of times the customer loyalty owes enough, you'll risk it, but uh, and when it's big, it's better to make sure you, you get paid for your time investment in putting together a comprehensive quote. And that's the beauty of the RFP. Do you have a, a, a contract you sign? Yeah, that's called the scope of work, which is actually a contract, but just to confuse you, like everything in telecom. <laughs> Are your forms uh, standardized? Did you get them somewhere? Did you generate them and uh, build them yourself? Or? It, it's just work product over the years, and then you just cut and paste it. You do need to understand what goes into it. You need to understand the network so you estimate the hours correctly. I'm not really doing it in hopes of getting my fee for writing the RFP. I just want to broker the deal. There's a lot more money in the residuals than the lump sum payout. I, I think from my, my understanding and, and my experience is that it's, it's the commitment, it's the emotional <coughs> commitment, the attachment to you um, before they made a decision on the carrier. Yeah, you want them to make that decision up in front and then everything else just will flow. And if you have to forego your fees because, you know, for whatever reason, because you're gonna get paid on the backside, that's fine because that's where you want money anyways. You mentioned a white label program for, um, I believe it was the RFP process. Is there anything like that? Does that go into the auditing process or the telecom expense management stuff you were talking about too? Correct. Okay. Yeah, they're just value-added services that, that we can do and, and uh, just 
you know, uh, a piece of something's better than all of nothing. So we can partner on any, any of those pieces. Correct. And I, I'd like to see people be rewarded for their efforts. I hate to see good agents spend a lot of time and learn every lesson I've learned, I did wrong. <laughs> You know, I, no one mentored me, no one told me, hey, watch out, your spreadsheet fodder. You know, I basically <laughs> just hit the brick walls and that's how I learned what to do right. It was the only thing left because I did everything wrong first. <laughs> Trust me. I think that's another a great point about getting involved in the RFP process as opposed to just um, responding to a request for a quote. Um, I know that we run into situations where people will request a quote and when you start trying to deep dive into questions that you really kind of need the answers to in order to really design a good fit and figure out what product set is really going to make the most sense for them, you get that sort of why are you asking that and just give me a quote for what I asked for and, and, um, and I really don't have time to you know, spend that kind of time with you answering all those questions. And if you can get them committed to an RFP process and they understand the superior um, quotes that they're going to get back, having these carriers respond to an RFP, now you can ask them literally any question and they will gladly respond to it because they will assume that you absolutely have to know in order to be able to put this together in a way that the carriers can all respond and that you have an apples to apples comparison. Yeah, and that, that's another thing I forgot to mention is the other key point when you're selling them on the RFP is you're going to get the carrier's best price up front. No games, no BS, no negotiations. That's the main point to the client why they want to do a formal RFP so they don't get a book of how great the network is and then somewhere in there is the actual pricing. You know, most clients have already formed an opinion of all the carriers and they just want to know what are they going to sell it to me for versus this carrier. If you're dealing with some of these larger opportunities, I'm sure you run across some people that are already either in the process or have completed their own RFP. How do you, how do you leverage that and get them on your side do something like that instead of just falling into what they want to do? Well, everyone raise their right hand and repeat after me. <laughs> I will not be nice to my clients. I am there to make money. <laughs> <laughs> and whenever anyone asks me for a quote, it's a joke inside my company, why do you think you need that? That's the first question I ask. Because clients don't know what they need. It's your job to tell them what they need, and I can't possibly tell you what you need until I understand your environment. Year, years ago, I had a sales coach that told me, you know, that they're, they're, actually, he's not a, you know, told me, is their, their, their motto is prospects lie. And so your prospects lie to you for whatever reasons, and your goal is to try to find out what the real truth is, and, and to help them, and to help yourself. You're not doing it for free. You're trying to, um, yeah, make out, get out of the, the term win-win, a win-win situation here. But uh, you can't take what they say on case value. They're lying for a lot of different reasons. Let me ask another question, uh, Jeff. Uh, this process that you're using, are you going back to your established customers and doing that, or are you developing new business this way? And if, in fact, you're developing new business this way, what can you share with us to help us develop new business this way? Well, I have a 104-step methodology that I've developed. <laughs> Literally, the person who wrote How to Land a Person on Mars wrote it for me. So I guess I can share that with everybody. But um, I don't deviate from my process. I question everything I talk in the first meeting or two less than 5% of the time. And the client is telling me, what their pain is. Because if there is no pain, and saving money is not pain. So if there's no pain, there's no sale. So you need to question everything that they're telling you and understand everything that's going on. How do they make money? Who gets fired when something goes wrong? Those are good questions to ask your client. 
the proposals encompass the business or the carrier services a lot more, right? You come from an IT background. Or are you talking about Ethernet switches and PBXs and everything in these proposals? Or, or is this just carrier service? Well, interesting. I could sell a lot of hardware and software. I choose not to because I only want to make residual income. So a lot of my agents are IT consultants because that's my world. So I just throw them that business. I bring them in. I bring my bars business because they bring me carrier business. So Did that answer your question. Well, I so your proposal or your RFP does it have all of the IT part of it, yeah. or is it just specifically carrier services? Just carrier services. All their buckets of business. And you tell your partners, hey, there's an RFP for other services. You can go right. <laughs> right. If the client needs hardware or software, eventually you will become your your client's trusted advisor in all things IT. That's exactly where you want to be. Because just like anyone who works for AT&T or Quest or Sprint is inherently biased, and it's okay to point that out, of course they're going to tell you how great their network is. That's all they can sell you. You know, why would you listen to that? I'm not selling you hardware, software, or IT consulting, you know, but I'll tell you what you need because I'm not selling it, they're much more likely to believe me. On the flip side, my IT consultants are saying, you need to deal with this guy because he'll shoot straight with you. And then I have instant credibility. So it's, I just, I take care of all that when I, I push it in another direction. So I don't overly complicate it. Good question. Jeff, uh, you tell me you get a lot of your opportunities working for your solution providers. I'd like to hear where, where Steve and Dale and, and where you guys are finding partners are opportunities. Do you figure opportunities you can with partners or how are you finding them? Yeah. <coughs> Most of my opportunities come from, and we spoke about this last year, farming my existing customer base. And, you know, that's really. I'm going to say 90% of my time is farming my existing customer base. Those customers out there, you may have gained them as a single T1 or wherever they came from. Keeping in constant communication with them, uh, you know, just reach out. Hey, how are things going? Uh, maybe you have more of a personalized relationship with them. You can call up for that, or maybe it's just purely business. And uh, you know, check with them. How are things going? You know. They might talk about other sites that they have that maybe had other contracts that are coming up for expiration. Um, also referrals, always ask for referrals. And I'm not real aggressive on asking for referrals. Um, I don't know if that's a positive thing or, or a negative thing, it works for me. But that is, uh, that's where I spend my time. <coughs> I, I just say that uh, for me personally, the uh, similar situation, I, I, I take care of smallest clients just as well as you take care of the largest clients. Small clients have a way of turning into your largest clients. I had uh, my single largest deal came from a client that originally hit my uh, my pathetic website uh, several years ago, um, and we're talking about six years ago. They bought a T1 and a PRI, and then uh, eventually they grew into a global MPLS. It was a, a very considerable size uh, size project, and uh, it, it was a very much a personal relationship, and I've, I've gone through actually. The, uh, the CFO, the IT director, he left, worked with his IT admin that became the IT director. You know, so you, the, the relationship has uh, changed, it's morphed, but still it's very personal. And the, uh, it's interesting that both the uh, outgoing CFO and the outgoing IT director brought me business to their new clients, to their new, their new employers. For, um, for our situation, the couple of big deals that we signed in the last quarter of um, 2009, both were brought to us through our partners that Charlie had established a relationship with, and neither um, neither one of them at that point in time had brought us any deals prior to that, and um, and so you know. You, what we find is that the bar partners, if they knew and really understood 
um, working with carriers, they would they just be doing it themselves and not putting another layer in between. So you really have to be willing to do the work for them and still give them a nice chunk of the compensation or they're not willing to send you the business. And so, um, so a lot of people, I think, get kind of stuck on not wanting to pay them for, um, for not doing a whole lot of the work, but in fact, that's exactly what we do. We do all the work and we give them a, a huge percentage of, of the money that we make, so. Yeah. Well, do you guys find that you are giving up when, when it comes to the partners that you don't have to have the compensation? Um, our um, situation is just about everybody's on a 50-50 split. <laughs> yeah, we, we discovered that, that doing quotes for agents and expecting them to go close deals wasn't working so well. And, and so we reversed the whole process. We want every deal to come to us, and unless you've closed hundreds of Fortune 500 accounts, it's hard to get good at it. If it's the first one you're trying to close, you're usually going to fail until you learn to succeed, and then you just got to repeat it. So it just was much easier to have everything come inbound, close the deal for everybody so everybody gets paid and, and can eat. We had a, a we still work with a, a, a small PV access dealer in, in uh, Washington, D.C. that gives us two or three deals a month consistently. And uh, we asked them periodically why they continue doing business with us. It's because we are really a partner with them. We do the design for them, the network design. We know their equipment, we know what they like, and uh, we work well with their support team. So we have a very um, multi-headed approach, multi you know, many many faces and names that the customer knows. They know they can go to, they know they can go to PBX Cooler, they can come to us. And it's um, interesting that uh, that model, you know, we, we, we have tried uh, to recruit PBX vendors because we know that they understand the the situation of dealing with the carrier is sometimes better than, in, in our experience, better than the IT vendors, because they're dealing with uh, AT&T or Verizon for a PRI or SIP service is a lot different than dealing with someone who's providing a single internet connection. But um, the PBX dealers are hard, hard to recruit and actually get, uh, uh, easy to recruit, hard to get traction with, with deals. So what we did find is that we found a single dealer that uh, has just bought into it and it's been very beneficial to us. You just need that one gem um, that really makes it worthwhile. And the nice thing with them, just to, just to close on that thought, is that they know what to request of us when they're pricing. <coughs> and they're, you know, they know what carriers they're comfortable with. So they are very explicit, very specific in what it is that we need to do for them. So it limits our, our exposure of doing a quoting and hoping. Um, and they, they look, when we first get in touch with the, con with the customer, it's after they've been proposed our solution and PBX vendor solution together, now we have a, a customer that's ready to buy. Sometimes the, carrier, the, the PBX vendor will collect the information that we need for our carrier contracts ahead of time. We complete the paperwork, send it out of them. Our first contact with the customer is when they're questioning, where do I, where do I sign? I love that. <laughs> yeah. Look, if you're going to use PBX vendors and IT consultants, it's very hard to gain their trust because they're trusted advisors for a reason. So it's a very uphill battle. So speaking their language, getting out of your office and driving over, and just just getting them to bring you in front of one customer with them, and then doing a great job, then they'll just consistently. Another thing that I'll add to that as well is um, when you get into the larger deals, the carriers are trying to upsell your customer um, with all sorts of additional services. They want to sell them you know, managed services, which typically includes the router. Now all of a sudden, what was a quarter of a million dollar router sale goes away. And so, um, you know, we've gotten into situations where, where there were, um, you know, monthly kind of services that the bar partner was planning on providing that were potentially going to be displaced for, by an upsold service. And so, um, we try to really tightly manage the communication 
you know, because once you get far enough along, now the carrier is communicating directly with the customer, and you've kind of lost control over what does and doesn't get presented to them. They're responsible to ask them, do you want fries with that as well? And so, um, so we try to be really proactive then with the bar partner to say, you know, uh, we're going to do the best we can, but the, this customer is going to hear about this service one way or the other. Whether they hear about it through these people we introduce them to, which potentially we're going to at least get paid off of, or they hear about it somewhere else, in which case nobody makes anything off of it. We much rather have them learn about it and have our help sifting through their options to determine whether that's really the best direction to go and then knowing that we're going to get some compensation from it. But if you don't have that conversation, that could be a bar partner relationship that would go south real quick and you would never see another referral from that bar partner. Just like us, if we refer, if we take a customer to a carrier and all of a sudden the direct side is beating up on them we're saying, hmm, that's just a little fishy, I'm not going down that rabbit hole again. So, you know, you just want to, you want to really understand how tentative they are about referring that relationship to you in the first place, and you got to handle it. <coughs> it so, I have a question for Tim. Well, there's two more questions. You uh, had a question for a while. I had, well, I had a couple of uh, couple comments. Steve talked about a couple of the reasons that the is work with us, but just as um, we get upset when a carrier messes up our relationship with one of our clients. Bars come to you because they believe that you will not do anything to interfere with their relationship with their clients. Their client, and they bring them to. Uh, so it's it, it's a it, it's a trust thing, and, and once you get that, it's it's fabulous. But you have to really manage those really really well. And you talk about giving up 50 percent and being a lot of money. Um, we give up 25 percent to get a lukewarm lead from the internet right from the internet right okay when a when a var gives you vars don't give you leads vars give you the name and address and phone number of somebody who needs a pri or they need you know we need to upgrade their network or we're doing voice over ip and we need to do mpls for them these aren't leads trust me you know you mentioned that you know, we could screw up their relationship well i've also had a situation where referral partners vendors bars have introduced me, we brought in a carrier service that is working just fine, but the equipment design, the network design that they, they brought in was not optimal. And the, but the, the finger pointing was, oh, it's the carrier, it's the carrier. And they were just trashing um, a, a carrier all no tell you know, they're trashing tell you know, because they're so unresponsive. It's like, oh my God, well, you know, we're, we're hearing this one again. AT&T does not have the standing with your customer that, that Harry who comes in and, and changes the, the code on that phone uh, yep. after the customer. Uh, so I, I assume that you're, many times you're, you're very clear and upfront with the carrier not to interject, and especially if there's a deal like that where, where the equipment's involved and maybe the carrier might have a solution to bring in and all, all, all encompassing the solution, you, you might say to them something like, we have an IT professional that's selling them the managed internet, the IT set, please don't offer that to this client. Uh, it, can you do that? Um, uh, we definitely have that conversation, and I can tell you that um, if we're on a conference call with decisions makers sitting around a table and we the conversation moves towards we've got this situation and we're really in a quandary we're sort of thinking about doing this but we're not sure and the carrier who is on the phone or you know sitting as part of the discussion has has a good fit for that there's nothing you're going to do to stop that train from rolling so, so you know what I'm trying to tell you is that um, is that this is definitely an issue, and you've got to prepare your guard partners that they're going to hear about this stuff one way or the other. And if we can have some control over how they're hearing about it and maintain the other thing too, that um, so you know, that they're prepared to respond to it. Well, and that and that 
Uh, the other thing is, you know, if we sell them, let's just say an MPLS network, and then we're going to go add on SIP trunks and add on, you know, consolidated POTS lines through Earnest and add on, you know, whatever else, we make it very clear to them that whatever business comes in with related to that relationship, they're going to get paid on. And so um, that's not what they're used to. You know, they're used to getting paid like one time, in and out, and when they start understanding that, oh, you know, uh, whatever happens, the way this customer grows over time, my commission potentially keeps expanding, it starts to look kind of appealing to them. And, you know, they won't, honestly, there's a fairly low trust level in the industry, so until they see it, they won't really believe it, to, but to really understand the evergreen um, nature of the commissions, that they're going to even get paid on referrals, I mean on um, renewals, and that they're going to get paid on additional, you know, uh, add-on, upsell business, that um, that definitely makes a difference. But you've got to communicate all that because they're, they're just sure that, you know, that you're somehow trying to slide, slide sideways with something. Roger. Yeah. I got two questions for Tim. Uh, Tim, you mentioned farming your existing base. Uh, other sites, expiring contracts, referrals. Um, the expiring contracts, if, for instance, ACC had some promos years ago where if it was X amount of miles, or, you know, it was a certain price. I'll give you an example, T1, 465 bucks, that same T today is 502. So do you just leave them on the month to month and take a chance of another carrier coming in and beating them out, uh, beating you out, or how do you address that? So the question for you and back in your Roger, in a nutshell, is some carriers, ACC being one of them, used to have promo pricing that is more aggressive than what you can get today, even with custom pricing. So when those contracts come up for expiration, what do you do with those? Um, it goes back to keeping in contact with the customer, uh, reaching out to them consistently, and yeah, they say on a month to month. I mean, there's. I always look at the best interest, look out for the best interest of the customer. And if you have a good relationship with them, you can have some level of confidence that they're going to stay with you. And if you're just up front with them, hey, listen, I can't get you better pricing on this product right now, but just make sure you're staying in contact with them. And on uh, referrals, <coughs> would you say, I've been doing that consistently for the last six months, I'd say. Uh, rarely get a referral. And I asked the question, or my new assistant, my new admin assistant is asking the question, and then we follow up with an email, but we get virtually zero response back. It's a pretty low response rate doing what you're talking about there, but it does pan out every now and then. You know, another thing to add, just a little bit off of that subject, uh, that uh, somebody made a comment here earlier that made me think about this. In today's economy, there's a lot of People getting laid off, including in IT departments. And one thing that we have really noticed here during the past, especially six months, is that the person that you used to keep in contact with, you know, every month, every other month, boom, they're gone. And you don't have another contact within that company. So you're calling up, they have a replacement, hey, you know, Sally, I used to work with Joe, uh, and I'm the one that helped you design your network and have all your carrier services through us and they're looking at you saying hey I don't know who you are I don't care we're gonna change our services we're gonna go somewhere else that's kind of a scary proposition so you know one thing that we're gonna be focusing on here immediately that we've already started on is um, getting multiple contacts within the organization and there are different contact levels I mean a lot of times you're just dealing with an IT manager or director um, it doesn't actually go up to the president level or somebody of that nature. But um, getting multiple contacts, uh, but also making sure that if you can get some type of personal contact information from the person that potentially leaves, chances are they're going to land a job in another organization. And guess what? If you've done a good job with them, they're right. going to rec recommend you to that company. So there's a another lead for you, a fresh lead. For you. <laughs> so we've seen that a lot over the past I'm going to say six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, referrals, just to add on, timing of a referral is everything. 
and the best time to ask for a referral is after they sign the contract before they go through the provision. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't learn anything else, learn that. And this has really helped me. I created a, a program with uh, Tiffany's, and I, I got a whole gift list, and I got a nice set of something. One referral that led to a sale, they got the first piece, the second one, the second piece, the third piece, fourth piece, and so on. And so I learned that from Tony Robbins. I'll give him credit. Thanks, Tony. Um, but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot more effective. And since I'm a master agent, I never miss a chance. Any new client, and I love to hunt. Hunting is a good thing because when you hunt business for yourself, you find business for your agents. And if you're not driving business to your PBX vendors and your IT consultants, even though you're paying them residual, they will stop sending you business. So always be working on two-way relationships and uh, give gifts for referrals and ask every new client, who's your IT consultant? Who's your PBX vendor? So every deal should turn into 10 more referrals of clients and two new agents. I think Tim, Tim brought up a good point you just did as well that your, your multiple relationships in the organization don't just have to be within that organization, but there are vendors as well. The person that answers the phone, the person that's, that's responsible for billing it, calls you the first time says, I've got this bill from Paytech or, or Quest. And what is this? And make, make a relate, develop a relationship there. IT, you know, the IT, the PBX vendor, if they weren't your partners before, they may not be your partners going forward, but at least they've seen you execute. And if you've executed well, they'll remember that. The next time they get in a deal where they go sour, they'll say, geez, when I worked with Steve, it didn't go sour. He, 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 yeah, he had that spreadsheet with all the numbers on it. And uh, they remember things like that. And it's, it's very helpful to keep, keep, it, uh, uh, keep multiple faces to your client. I've got a question. My name is Mike Boards. I'm from Michigan. And about six to eight months new into the business. And I appreciate everything you guys are saying. It's helpful to me. But if somebody could maybe just touch on just to give like a two minute little quick intro as far as contacting bars. And Todd has been great with us as far as guiding us and showing us what to do. And could somebody speak on your perspective on that initial phone call, what you do, how you do? I'll jump in. I think, uh, I think we'll probably all have different answers for you. But uh, one thing that I always do when I work with a client, if they ever work with an outside vendor, a VAR, PBX vendor, data vendor, whatever it is, always, always, always get that contact information. Keep that contact information. Keep a relationship with them. And then usually after the sale, I'll call that VAR <laughs> away from the customer and just explain our program. You know, what it is exactly that we do is from a carrier perspective and then also from the VAR program perspective to see if it's something that they're interested in doing. And uh, that's that's uh, probably how I've added most of my VAR partners. And I, I will say this, it's really tough to make a VAR part, bar, bar partner produce or, or get them to produce, get them to bring you leads that actually do something. Um, it, it's a great idea and I think if you spend a lot of time doing that, you can definitely get some gold nuggets out of it, but it is tough. But the thing is, is when you're working with a client, it's, it's simple. I mean, you're just recording additional data that you already should have or should be getting well, you most, keeping in contact. Most likely too, uh, Tim, you're going to get that information when you ask for their vendor. And, and it becomes almost an implicit referral too to that vendor, to that vendor from his individual <coughs> customer which is the, 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 the most beneficial type of referral or introduction. You know, it's the customer saying, uh, here, uh, an IT vendor, here's, another, here's my carrier vendor that I'm working with. The two of you get together, make sure you treat me well. And that's the best kind of referral you can get. But I agree with Tim that you know, recruiting bars cold is, is, a, is a shotgun approach. But you get that one nugget, and, uh, and, they, and they, they turn business off for you regularly, the guys that really do get it. And it's very helpful. But you have to go through, you have to kiss a lot of frogs, find the grits. That's a key phrase to, to use the vendor. 
said we have a mutual client. Yes. Yeah, I always yeah, yeah, and he might have been the client. He might have been the vendor first. They they had an existing relationship. But maybe even, he would have been. Even when you're contacting during implementation, those are really magic words to say we're on the same team. We have a mutual client. So mm -hmm. Well, one more just nugget here is understanding their business is really important. And in this economy, it's the best time ever to recruit new VAR partners and simply, you know, just telling them a few truths. All your income comes from one-time sales, one-time revenue. You start the month over at zero every month. How would you like to create a recurring revenue stream that over time will bring in more money than your core business? And that's just being honest with them. Because if you can do work once and get paid forever, you're always going to outperform someone who has to sell every month a new thing with lump sum income. So don't be afraid to tell them the truth. And, and they should be looking for alternative incomes because it's hard to sell a PBX right now. <laughs> there's a lot of competing models and there's a lot of hosted and zip trunks and asterisk boxes and freeware and when, when you've got a ten when you get when you have equipment with a ten year useful life and that could easily be extended to twelve or fifteen years with a little bit of maintenance, you know, and then it the work or putting in a hundred thousand dollars capital equipment. The other thing that we've been very successful with is uh, not all vendor not all suppliers or carriers offer, but with uh, Paytech they have their equipment for services program, EFS. Uh, we're doing a, a deal that's on the table right now. We'll tell, talk about two deals that we did. One was only about six, maybe seven thousand dollars MRC MPLS with a PRI, um, three-year term, and Paytech kicked in twenty-five thousand dollars equipment credit, free money to the customer, theoretically free money. Um, we're doing another one that will run, run in about eleven thousand dollars. Again, an MPLS uh, deal with some voice thrown in. Uh, we're, we have two options. One is going to be almost thirty thousand dollars in credit on a three-year term or $40,000 on a five-year term. So not only does it get the customer a, a nice bucket load of cap capital, but it also uh, protects our revenue for five years if they go with that route. Protecting is the dollar ninety nine T one. If you yeah. want uh, Bill Gates money as well, there's a wonderful uh, Microsoft program with Microsoft Gold Partners out there. Microsoft will kick in a third the VAR, the VAR partner will kick in a third and the client only has to pay a third. And so if you're working with uh, Microsoft, that's some great value to bring to your customer. And a lot of times IT consultants aren't even aware of that program. So educating your, if you can sell your VARs better than they can sell themselves, you've shown value. <laughs> And they will keep bringing you back in front of their clients. And when their check starts coming in the mail, then they'll really start putting you in front of your clients. When their checks start coming in, you need to watch it real closely too, because the first thousand dollars that they get is the hardest money they're ever going to earn. So you need to really pay attention to what they're doing and sit down with them and do some, some revenue with them and some account money with them. They're hard. You're talking about the first thousand dollars.
just geek speak. And um, that is a really important thing, though, I just thought of it. So never assume a CIO or a CTO or an IT director understands technology. A lot of times they have no clue. And they will really appreciate it if you take the time to draw on a whiteboard. I know it sounds stupid, but this is a T1. These are the 24 channels. Each channel 64K. I've got more business and more people have pulled me aside after the meeting and said, thank you so much for explaining to me what the difference between switch and dedicated is. And now sit. <laughs> Clients really appreciate you taking the time. So I feel I'm most I most resemble a teacher now, which who'd have thought I'd become a teacher? <laughs> education, education is a key, but uh, you, you asked a question about uh, local or remote. remote. Do you uh, work face-to-face -face with them? Uh, I'm based in Denver. I have two customers that are um, in Denver. I've not ever met either of them. And I have 250 billing customers around the country. Um, so most of my new logos, in fact, all my new logos are over the phone. Or what? Oh, are uh, closed over the phone. And I'm exactly the same as Steve. I live in Spokane, and I just have a very small handful of customers there. The rest are spread out all over the nation. But the, the big Fortune 500 ones, you go to them. Oh, yeah. You shake their <laughs> hand. <laughs> you're in the boardroom, and you're whiteboarding in their room. You don't close business with them remotely. I, I've met all my largest customers. <laughs> that was definitely a the, the small transactional stuff, there's no need. Yeah, I think. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. And you were right, Jack. The bars are face to face people. Well, you can't prove you're worthy of them bringing you in to their customer until they see you earn that respect. And getting them to give you that chance is a very hard thing. So you just beg, just put me in front of one of your smallest clients. Let me prove it to you. Well, that's that's why uh, I, I made the statement earlier. You treat your your smallest client just as well as you treat your large client, largest clients. You do, I do as much planning and prep work for a single PRI cutover as I'll do for a 15 site MPLS network. Well, you know, exactly the amount, but you know, I'll have I'll have the le level of detail will all be there. You can't you can't you can't skimp on it. And then, uh, then the second, when, when they're done, they'll say, oh, that was a good experience. I knew what, what my DIDs were. I knew what the IP addresses were. When I, my technician showed up, he was ready to go. And I don't typically sit in on cut calls, on cutover calls. I've got you know, other things to do at that point. And, I'm not, and I can't affect the quality of service during a cutover. There's nothing I can do during a cut, except for maybe tell, tell the engineers what it should have been. <laughs> you busy you a lot of that communication? Um, I do not. I spy a spreadsheet. It. Yeah. Yeah. Occasionally, uh, for a, for an MPLS network, yeah, mm -hmm. Visio. Uh, often, I'll get a Visio from the carrier because they're the ones that are right. assigning uh, circuit IDs and, I, and uh, IP addresses. Uh, but, you know, subnet addresses, all of that. The carriers will do with me. I mean, I'm not. I'm not an engineer anymore. I used to be one a long, long time ago. Um, so I, I, I tell my customers, I'm not the engineer. I just uh, sound like one to them. Yeah, you, you gain the most respect by the questions you ask. And if you're not asking the right questions, and when you do a cutover for PRIs or voice, if you're not demanding from the carriers that they give you test DID numbers, test toll-free numbers, they don't do it by default. You have to know that they can do it. You have to tell them they can do it, and you have to make them do it. And Pulling one PRI from this CO and another PRI from this CO, CO, a lot of agents don't have any idea that can be done. It can, and it needs to be. And that's your job is to learn that, learn how to prevent an outage before it happens. So when an outage occurs, the client's still doing business, making, receiving phone calls, surfing the web. And, and doing what they need to do to make money and, and stay in business. That that's a, brings up a great expression I used to tell a lot of my customers, you know, pre, pre cut. I said, look, it's something is going to go wrong. So you always under promise, over deliver. Mm -hmm.
you tell them something's going to go wrong. The day of the cut, I'm not sure what it is. We do a lot of planning to prevent it. If I knew it was going to go wrong, we plan around it. But something will go wrong. Uh, somebody will forget a DID, they'll change DIDs at the last minute, uh, the circuit won't get tested in time, the equipment won't show up. There's a lot of moving pieces. Or my favorite, they will port and rest board a week before the oh, cut. Yeah. Horizon. <laughs> Horizon. Horizon. Make Horizon. sure you are the numbers, port the numbers, you know, lose the numbers, drop the numbers a day ahead. Um, the, and then, then the, my next statement is when something goes wrong, I mean, it could be as bad as dislocation is out of phone service for 24 hours. That could be as bad as, I'll tell them, that's as bad as it'll get, probably. And they'll say, whoa, out of service for 24 hours. Now, when is the last time you've seen a cut go that horribly bad? Probably not. No, but no. then I tell them again, the, me the measure of, of, of your professionalism, the carrier's professionalism, your vendor, and myself, is how we respond to it. We'll get it fixed. So just be aware when something do, do, does go wrong, don't you know? Don't, don't call them the cavalry. We'll get it done. Yeah, and then just recognizing bizarre outages. It's a bad facility. It takes years and years of experience to learn the symptoms. And then also with all the CLEX around the country, it's very common. Someone who calls from this suburb on this CLEX cannot call the business anymore post cut. And it's a simple database update. It is not the new carrier's fault. It's the carrier where the guy's you coming know, from. We, we've seen that a lot recently. We even had a, one of our, our the carrier that reported to um, you know, said, "Look at it, it's your it's your cut." You know, the, our, our customer had customers calling into them, so it's our customer's customer mm -hmm. that couldn't reach them. And so our our carrier said, "Look at it, if you give me the names, the numbers, I'll, I'll reach out to them and." Uh, tell them how they, they need to work with their carrier to get their database updated, the MPAS database. It was uh, it's hard to explain to a customer when they, that when they when they cut over to a new carrier and they it was numbers working can't yesterday be reached. And today it's not working. Hey, it's and the only carrier. thing that's different is this new carrier. So a lot of that's just experience. But if you if you learn a little bit today and when that happens to you, oh, I remember. I think this might be the problem. You gain a lot of credibility when you pull those rabbits out of your hat. I'm just wondering, you know, uh, what you guys see out there in the market because historically, you know, talking about problems coming up, historically it used to be uh, if there was a problem, a lot of times it wasn't the carrier side, and I was the one scrambling to make sure they got it fixed. And, and lately, it's been a little bit more convoluted for me. I've had a couple of bars bring me a couple of deals. And you know whether it was a PRI or an integrated P1 with a PRI handoff or something like that, the vendor was putting in some new crazy phone system, you know. And and the day of the cut, it went bad. And in both cases, it seemed most of the problems were on the hardware side. And yeah. that's been a new deal. I mean, it would come like you know the customer. I mean, in, they were down 24 hours. I mean, there were some real problems. Sip, sip trunks are notorious. There's a lot of issues with SIP being done terribly. And a lot of clients aren't even aware, the PBX vendors aren't even aware that you need a piece of middleware called a separator just to do translations to get the stuff to work. You don't have a separator, you're going down. Well, like for example, I always pride myself on trying to avoid problems, you know, and so I always try to make sure that I know what the carrier's doing so that you know the customer doesn't have any surprises, it goes in as planned, et cetera, et cetera. So the new challenge I'm being faced with now, it seems, is how do I make sure the data vendor knows what he's doing to, to interface with what the carrier's providing? Because that's been in two cases in a row, the, the data vendor was not prepared. And in the days of old, where you had an interconnect that had a warehouse of stock, is no longer the case. You know, they're getting as need shipping. You know, and so that part that they just bought doesn't work. They don't have another one. And they cut away, and it's been crazy. I don't know what's going on with these vendors. Well, it's, it's, there's, there's one throat to choke, and it's yours, yeah. or mine, in my case. You need to grill those vendors as hard as you grill your client, as hard as you grill your IT consultant, so you're comfortable that they know what they're doing, because you're going to get blamed for everything, trust me. So, so if you're not technical enough to grill them and make sure they know what they're doing, then get an SE on the phone from the carrier to do it for you. I'm 
just I'm just wondering, are, are carriers delivering stuff differently than they used to, like with the PRI stuff? I mean, in both cases, they couldn't get the detail to work. And two different vendors, two different systems, two different carriers, but it was basically the same problem. It, it's all generation wise fault. <laughs> <laughs> they have no attention to detail. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's my brother. He did. <laughs> now, I, I've had notorious problems with uh, data vendors that are, that are growing into uh, telephony. Right. Platinum Cisco dealers that have been identified by Cisco as you know one of my best Cisco dealers, and we're, now we're going to upgrade you and have you sell VoIP and have you sell um, uh, their uh, uh, excuse me their uh, uh, <laughs> their. Uh, what the heck is call that? It's call manager, thank you very much. And and, uh, and other Cisco uh, telephony equipment. But the problem is their um, their certified engineers are cert uh, might be certified on, on the telephony, but it's all book learning for a lot of them. They're getting more experience, they're they're maturing. But the data vendors moving into telephony, from my, my personal experience, has been a little challenging. There's a there's an acronym shock. You know, there's the telephony acronyms are not the same as the the, uh, the, the internet and the data, the LAN acronyms, uh, there's the um, level of service that, 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 that you expect on the telephony side. You, you don't necessarily expect it and demand it from the data, data side. So there's a lot of um, a lot of finger pointing that it's the carrier's fault from the IT vendor's problem. I had a kid who was a CCIE. He said, this voice stuff is hard. 